uh, and apparently uh, <clears throat> Steve also started recording it uh, and mm -hmm. he's going to put his recording also on YouTube uh, I would like to thank him thank him for accepting our invitation I happen to came to know um, about uh, oh sorry <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, when I was a member of uh, a mailing list, uh, maybe Steve also know, knows about that. Panel, uh, Michael Perelman used to uh, run that uh, mailing list. Uh, but, yeah. Heterodox, um, uh, maybe uh, progressive economists. Uh, indeed, Panel stands for Progressive Economists Network. Um, and the reason why I I uh, learned about uh, yeah, Steve is that he had a book then, uh, Debunking Economics. Uh, he, he was not only debunk debunking neoclassical economics, but also was saying a few things about uh, Marxian economics as well in that book. And unfortunately, in that panel, most of the people were Marxists. So uh, 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 they weren't very happy with uh, uh, Steve's debunking of Marxism either. But nevertheless, uh, uh, since then, uh, it has been uh, tw 20 years or so, um, he contributed a lot uh, to heterodox economics, uh, changed uh, many things, uh, heavily crit criticized most of the mainstream economics these days is uh, working on, if I'm not wrong, um, climate uh, most of, mostly. Um, um, another important thing that... Uh, connect uh, him and I is is a uh, focus on uh, debt and debt cancellation and indeed he's going to talk about that today also um, anyway I think uh, I said enough he's quite well known uh, he doesn't need any introduction um, it's yours Steve we are listening to you okay thanks okay thank you very much thank you so I'll just actually um, share the screen I've got my presentation I hope I don't take too long, but it is a long presentation. So let's see how we go. So the topic, uh, oh, <laughs> that's the wrong one. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, I'm going to go to this one, and now I hit my share screen. Sorry about that. What a great way to start a recorded presentation. Okay, this is what I want to talk about. The macroeconomics of endogenous money and a way out of the debt trap. And uh, if you look at what we see in the conventional literature, it's all from the neoclassicals, and it's all demonizing private debt. So this is Mancu's first year macroeconomics textbook and says the government affects national saving through public saving, uh, which is the difference between what it receives in tax and what it spends. So the, we, the public could save more if we tax more and spent less, in other words. And when it's spending it exceeds its revenue, it runs a budget deficit, which is negative public saving. Now I'm going to come around and show that it's actually 100% wrong. It's actually positive public saving by the public. We'll get that in a moment. And he said a budget deficit raises interest rates, crowds out investment, and there's a reduction in the capital stock, and that's part of the burden of national debt on future generations. This is what's saturated into the minds of students doing economics all around the world. And then it runs a budget surplus. It can retire national debt and stimulate investment. So a surplus is, will stimulate the economy and a deficit will depress it. That's, again, 100% wrong, but it will get there in a moment. But it has to borrow from the private sector and uh, that's where the money, when the government spends, it borrows money from the public. It doesn't create money. It borrows it, which, again, is 100% wrong. Uh, and that's an unjustifiable burden on future generations. So this is, the, the, this is why we get the hostility uh, to the sort of proposals we put forward, because this is what people are learning um, or, or being told. I don't think it's actually, I can't call this learning. But this is the usual uh, mindset that people get out of an economics textbook. And of course, that's what politicians work from and what uh, journalists work from as well. And of course, you can't get away from the supply and demand curve to illustrate this. So the idea is there's a supply of money. And notice the subscript up here. I want to emphasize this. That subscript, LF, up here, stands for loanable funds. Okay? This is the essential part of the model. If money of supply was... Uh, properly captured by loanable funds, then that's fixed by the amount of money people currently have and they're willing to lend. Um, you'll get more lending at a higher interest rate. 
uh, but that therefore crowds out, means a high interest rate crowds out private. So the deficit increases demand for money and causes a higher interest rate. And that's the mindset that people learn when they're doing uh, a standard course in economics around the world. Now, of course, we all know that dear old Ben Bernanke got a Nobel Prize, inverted commas for those who don't know, have to ask me later, a Nobel Prize in economics. And he got it for work that was published in this collection of essays called Essays on the Great Depression. And he says, uh, declines in aggregate demand were the dominant factor in the onset of the depression. That's the first thing I've read so far from the screen that is, I actually agree with. And he then says, there's two questions. What caused the collapse in aggregate demand? And why didn't the stabilizing factors come through and get us out of it? You know, why didn't prices and wages adjust to uh, uh, cope with the change in demand situation? And you know, we're back to a, the typical thing of a, a booming economy. Now, there are great questions and he had lousy answers for them. And the first thing he did was reject Irving Fisher's explanation of where the crisis came from. So Irving Fisher, writing in 1933 in the debt deflation theory of great depressions, this is how Fisher is summarized by Van Anke in his book. He envisions a dynamic process, or at least that's true, falling asset prices and commodity prices put pressure on nominal debtors, forcing them into distress sale of assets, causing further price declines and financial difficulties. Now he says this, what Fisher argued was accepted by Roosevelt. And this is part of where the New Deal came from. He said his idea was less influential in academic circles because of the counter argument that debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group debtors to another group creditors. And without huge differences in their spending, uh, pure redistribution should have no significant macroeconomic effects. And then he went on to his own neoclassical attempt to interpret Fisher. But it's, noted, it's based, as I pointed out with the man cue earlier, loanable funds is an essential part of it, which is why I got his bloody Nobel Prize. Now, I thought that in 2014, the worries of sensible people like us about this stuff were over because the Bank of England came out and said what we've been saying for more than half a century, that banks are not intermediaries. Banks originate money and debt. And my preferred acronym these days is not endogenous money, the, which I think only makes sense to people inside the literature. I talk about bank originated money and debt. Got a great acronym, BOND, and that's the real world. And this is what the Bank of England said in 2014. Bank lending creates deposits. They don't lend out deposits, they create them. And the Bundesbank said the same thing in slightly more complicated language, but very accurate. A bank grows loans without any prior inflow of customer deposits, and book money is created as a result of an accounting entity. It grants a loan, it puts the credit inside the customer's bank as a site deposit, um, and this refutes a popular misconception that bank acts as simply as intermediaries. That didn't stop the, neo the neoclassicals awarding the Nobel Prize to Bernanke for that popular misconception. So they just ignore any any contradictory evidence, which is I've just found typical of these twits that they just, you know, they, anything that's critical just goes over their head and they stick with their belief system. Now, well, I want to show that the reason endogenous money matters is that it's it, when you have banks creating money, credit, which is the annual change in debt, of, is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. And I do this starting from the identity of income is identical to expenditure. And this is the, the fundamental proposition that even neoclassical accept in, in, in uh, macroeconomics. Your expenditure is somebody else's income. What you spend is income for the person who receives your spending. So what I, I was challenged on this is critiquing my arguments when in the post-Keynesian literature by Brett Feiberger. He said, unless Kingen showed that this is false, then he has to give up his argument that credit is part of aggregate demand. I thought, well, I know it's true. I'm sure I'm right. And Michael Hudson and I were the same on the same page on this. So I should be able to prove it using expenditure as identical to income. So I invented the idea of a Moore table named after Basil Moore. And that shows expenditure on the horizontal of a table and net income on the vertical. And it's showing flows in dollars per year. And the idea here is that uh, you have, your expenditure is on the diagonal, the income is on the off diagonal, and the two are necessarily equal. Uh, and the aggregate, the, the negative of the sum of the diagonal is aggregate expenditure. The sum of all the off diagonal is aggregate income. They are necessarily the same. So let's just illustrate it. I'll, I'll start with a simple case where there's no lending or banking. And you have three sectors, household services and manufacturing. And households are spending A dollars per year on services and B dollars per year on manufacturing. When you sum the row, you get zero. 
services, C, dollars per year on housing, D, on manufacturing, sum the zero, et cetera, et cetera. And then the vertical sums can be different to zero, but the aggregate of those is also zero, which is one reason we work with gross uh, rather than net in macroeconomics. So our aggregate expenditure is the negative of the sum of the diagonal, and that gives you minus, minus, minus A to minus F. Aggregate income is A to F. They're necessarily equal. Now let's bring in loanable funds. And this is why loanable funds are such an essential part of the mythology of neoclassical economics. What you have is one non-bank lending credit dollars per year to another non-bank. To illustrate this, I've got the services sector lending to the household sector. So that is not lending is not a purchase. So it doesn't show uh, off the diagonal. It's a transfer along the diagonal. So the uh, uh, services sector is lending credit dollars per year to the household sector, and then is spending C dollars per year on households and D minus credit dollars per year on manufacturing. And the A's and F's don't have to be the same as the previous table. It's just showing these are the different flows that are involved. So it's still sending C dollars per year on services, D minus credit dollars per year across there. Now, when you do your sums, credit cancels out. Okay, Credit is not part of aggregate demand and income in loanable funds. The interest payments are, because that's actually a transfer, interest is transferred from households to services, but credit cancels out. There's no role for credit in aggregate demand or income in the myth of loanable funds. So if, if, if loanable funds actually describe the real world, that Vanaki would have been right to ignore Fisher, but it doesn't describe the real world. What it does is bank originated money and debt. So what I've got to show now is bank lending and I've now got to bring in the banking sector, which gives me a fourth sector. And I've also got to look at the assets of the banking sector as well as the liabilities, because money in the real world is fundamentally the liabilities of the banking sector. And therefore, we have household spending, borrowing credit dollars per year from the banking sector, and then spending credit dollars per year on manufacturing. So the same basic story as the previous thing, only the money they're using is being created by bank lending. So this is now the full table. And all the action is on the diagonal of the liabilities and equity. And you can see I've got uh, household spending A dollars per year on services, B plus credit per year dollars per year on manufacturing, and paying interest dollars per year to the banks. And the credit, the money they're getting is created by bank originated money and debt. So the debt's gone up, which is the assets, the liabilities have gone up, uh, the, the deposits. And what you get when you do your sums is credit does not cancel. Credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. And that's the essential important element of talking about endogenous money, which has been something post-Keynesians and have been arguing about for 50 years. So credit does not cancel out. And because it's such a volatile part of aggregate demand and aggregate income, and it can be go negative with no other component can go negative, except what the deficit can, but that's uh, never quite the same scale. Um, credit can go strongly positive and strongly negative. And that makes it much, much more important. So when you look at the data, and the funny thing is, when Bernanke made this claim, he didn't even look at the data. And the data existed. This is a, a census publication on the Colonial Times in 1970, published in 1975, showing debt by different financial sectors. And the BIS does a similar thing, days with an excellent database that I use extensively in my own research. And this is, my, this is an extension of my Minsky software I'm showing here called Ravel, by the way which is designed for uh, data analysis. So this is data from the, from the Bureau of the, of, of the Census plus the Bank of International Settlements going right back to 1790 for pre-government debt and from, I think, 1830 uh, for private debt. And when you take a look at it, credit was negative in the 1930s. And this is what caused the crisis. That's why it lasted so long. And that's something which is ruled out a priori by Bernanke's logical Logical, illogical system. Working, this is actually what, what did was it? It was Keynes's marvelous statement about Hayek uh, that it, he was an excellent example of how a logician working from, from false premises can end up in bedlam. Well, this is the bedlam of the neoclassical economists. They rule out what matters most and then can't explain the phenomena. So here we have negative credit during the 1930s. Uh, and the same thing applied when Bernanke was in the hotspot on the Federal Reserve, negative credit in 2008. And you look at the, the bottom chart, which are two charts which show uh, the aggregate debt level and then change in debt as a percentage of GDP. You can see that the three major crises America has had, the Great Recession, which we all know about, that we're starting 
to forget even that courtesy of COVID, the Great Depression, which hopefully will never be forgotten, the one thing called the Panic of 1837. And I only re realized about this myself when I produced this chart because I saw, hey, this amazing negative credit here, what's going on? And I looked back and found that was called the Panic of 1837 which was regarded as the greatest crisis of capitalism uh, at the time. Then we have the 1930s, the longest crisis, and then the brief one we had in 2008, where some of the actions neoclassicals took running, but they ran the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, helped to some extent and slowed down how long it remained negative. But it would have been a damn sight better if post-Keynesians had been in control. So looking at that, private debt does matter when neoclassicals assume that it doesn't. Uh, it's the most volatile component of aggregate demand, and it's the only one that can turn negative and very, very rapidly. So Fisher was right. This is the guy we should have given the Nobel Prize to posthumously. I don't care that's not part of the rules. Uh, and for the right reasons, he understood endogenous money and he rejected loanable funds. So dear old Ben, who's praying there, should have remained in church and not had any impact on policy. Fisher's the one we should have followed. Now, this is Fisher from 1932 saying new money is created not by the mint or the Bureau of Engraving, but merely by the pen and ink of the banker and his customer. And then he says, when the banker, when the customer then repays the debt, he undoes the whole transaction. The payment of a business debt to a commercial bank has consequences very different to debt paid from one individual to another. That a man-to-man -man debt may be paid without affecting the volume of outstanding currency. Whatever currency is paid by one is received by the other and is still outstanding. But when a debt to a commercial bank is paid, that amount of deposit currency simply disappears. So Fisher knew what he was talking about. Bernanke did not. And as usual, the idiot overrules the wise person in economics. And you take a look again at that 1940, 20 to 1940 data. It's just taking the same data I showed you a moment ago, but accentuating it. Look at the period there of negative credit. Okay? And the fact the intriguing isn't just the original downturn. It's also what happened in 36 when Roosevelt was persuaded to go back and to try to balance the budget. And what happened was people went back into deleveraging. So we had a rest restoration of the downturn and unemployment went from 11% back to 20%. Unemployment's measured over here. And that, I think, is why Keynes was received so well, because that happened at the same time the general theory came out. And at this point, neoclassicals were in complete despair. And that's where they should have stayed. Unfortunately, the buggers revived themselves afterwards, um, but they couldn't understand it. Please give us an explanation. Keynes comes along and wonderfully, even better than that, Hicks comes along and reinterpret Keynes as a neoclassical and everybody's happy. And we had the post, the post World War II neoclassical revival. Uh, but again, this is the data. I'm, I just find this gobsmacking that I've shown this charts, dozens of conferences. I've never seen one neoclassical follow up on it. According to them, the correlation of these two series should be roughly zero. It's roughly 0.9. Okay. When credit goes up, unemployment goes down. When credit goes down, unemployment goes up. According to them, that relationship is, is correlation coefficient of zero. Oh, there's people in the waiting room, pardon me. I just better actually let them in here. Um, I'll just actually, uh, okay, admitting two more people. And um, if can anybody else take that over? I'll just um, actually I might just go across to the uh, to Zoom and turn off the um, turn off the wait room. Pardon me, I'll just do this so I don't have people. Um, uh, See why I'm doing it actually, but uh, oh, I just moved oh, good. away you, from you, my machine. You, mm. you, you don't do, worry. You do it. That's fine. Uh, that's good. I do okay, I'll keep don't, don't don't worry. Uh, I, I'm paying attention to the uh, waiting room. Good, thank you. That's fantastic. Okay, so this this is why private debt is so important. We have to comprehend the dynamics of private debt, and that's where Minsky comes in. And this is probably my favourite quote from Minsky in terms of a logical foundation for analysing the role of debt. And this is, again, puts him outside most of the post-Keynesian school who really couldn't understand what he was talking about, about this particular point. Uh, but he said, the natural starting point for analysing the relationship between debt and income. And it took, I had a long debate with, uh, with, uh, with post-Keynesians, my own fellow post-Keynesians, to establish this point. And I still don't know if I'd convince them or not. But there is a relationship between debt and income. Minsky was aware of it. He said, you take an economy which with cyclical past that is now doing well. And the inherited debt structure of the economy reflects a previous time when there was a crisis. So there's a margin of safety built into the levels of borrowing. 
But as the economy continues to do well, people realize that existing debts are easily validated and the units that were heavily in debt prospered. So it pays to lever. And that then means the acceptable amount of debt in financing goes up. That causes the economy to turn into a boom. And therefore, stable growth is inconsistent with how investment is determined in a capitalist economy. And this is like the ultimate punchline, the most important thing Minsky ever said. The fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to transform doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability in a capitalist economy. And he was dead right. So I've been working on that you know, for 30 years now. And I realized relatively recently, about five or 10 years ago, that it was possible to derive Minsky's hypothesis directly from macroeconomic definitions. I want to show that. I'll go through this part quickly, but I've got all the notes there and I'll share the slides. So if anybody wants to check the mathematics more with more leisure than I'm going to go through now, that's quite possible. So the employment rate, which I use the symbol lambda for, is the number of people with a job divided by population. The wages share of GDP is wages divided by GDP. Private debt ratio is debt divided by GDP. They're definitions. Now, uh, and they, they got output to low employment ratio and then the capital to output ratio. These are all definitions so far. Now, you can differentiate those using very simple rules. This is what I'm, I'm going to do uh, in the next couple of slides. If you define the, 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 effectively the percentage rate of change of something, 1 over x dx dt is x hat. And then what you get out of that, x, the percentage rate of change of two things multiplied together is the sum of the two percentage rates of change. And the, the ratio of two is the difference of the two percentage rates of change. It makes it incredibly simple to take a statement like the employment rate and turn it into a dynamic statement. So if we differentiate those with respect to time, what you get are these three statements. The employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of change in the output to labor ratio and population growth. And that's literally a definition. I haven't built a model yet. The wages share of output will rise if wages grow faster than GDP. And the debt ratio will rise if private debt grows faster than the economy. Those are three definitional statements we've put in dynamic form. To show how they're done, I'll let this one roll out and then I'm going to go through rapidly through the others. Actually, I'll, I'll show the wages share, but that's got a neat little trick to it. So you just go through that and that's a very simple uh, ex exercise. One of my old math lecturers used to call this money for old rope. It's very, very simple to do. Now, the wages share which was quite complicated in the way this was first done by Richard Goodwin, is actually extremely simple as well. So you have the wages share of GDP is the ratio of wages to GDP. That gives you the percentage rate of change of the one I mentioned in the earlier slide. Bring in uh, a nominal. Now, this, this, I'm going now from a definition to a model because I'm assuming there's a uniform wage level. So you've got wage, the wages, the wage rate times labor. Then I just separate this out. So I've got wages plus change of wages plus change in labor minus change in GDP. And labor, we're now using the definition of the output to labor ratio. I bring that's Y over A. And then I get expand that out and the Ys cancel. And I get the rate of change of wages share is the rate of change of wages minus, minus labor, the, the change in the output to labor ratio. Very simple. And then you've got to define Y. And that, again, if you see in a fixed capital output ratio, that drops out as being the same as the rate of change of capital. And then in the original way that Goodwin first did this, he assumed all profits are invested. So gross investment is output minus wages, and you solve for K. And I've jumped through that very quickly. But it, 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 again, it's, it's simple stuff. If you follow the rules, there's no problem at all in deriving this. And then Phillips brought it, the assumption that Goodwin used was a simple linear Phillips curve. So you have a slope of the Phillips curve and a point at which uh, the wage rate doesn't change. This is the actual level of unemployment. Um, and so the final model ends up being these two sets of differential equations, very, very simple. And when you put them in proper differential equation form, you're just multiplying through by the lambda and the omega on the other side. And you simulate this in, in software and what you get is the cycle, the, the fixed cycle that was a Goodwin cycle back in 1967, which he actually wrote as a sort of birthday present to Karl Marx on the 100th anniversary of uh, Das Kapital being published. I won't show that model, but I'll show a couple of other models later. Now, that's the alternative to Ramsey. We should have been using Goodwin models. Ramsey is a waste of time. And that's quite literally. It, it wastes time by not having time properly in it. Uh, Goodwin got trashed by a paper written by Harvey. And I have to confess a certain role here because I was the referee, one of the referees, who allowed this to be published. And then when I tried to use his numbers at a later point, 
I was disappointed by the result. He said, it doesn't fit the data at all. Good model's really, really bad as a low model for the data. I didn't like it, but I, you know, I thought, okay, the econometrics looks good. And there's a whole array of numbers on the table. And then the later point, I thought, well, I better, I'll use his numbers because he's researched all these numbers. And then I put it in graphs and I got crazy results. So I wrote to him and said, David, what's going on? I use your Phillips curve numbers and they're crazy. And he, he said, I have a transcription error. I mean, he called it a, a typical schoolboy error. He forgot divide, divide by 100. So all these numbers in that table are out by a factor of 100. No wonder he showed that it didn't fit the data. So Matteo Scroselli and a research student of his Maharishi uh, did the work and said, once you fix it up, it fits the data very, very well. Now, um, I'd recommend if you want to understand Goodman, don't read Goodman, read, read uh, Blatt, John Blatt. So I highly recommend how Blatt explained it. That's why I got my head around Goodwin. And then I used that to bring in debt. Goodwin, for very crazy idiosyncratic reasons, left the financial system out of his modeling. I'm happy to talk about it later. Minsky tried to add it in, but he used the multiplier accelerator model in discrete time. And I knew when I first read Minsky that that was false because I'd already proven that the multiplier accelerator model is a false model of the economy. Um, so when you bring it in, you get a third dimension. And for those who know their chaos theory, that's where you get chaotic behavior coming out of it. So I added private debt in, and then I had to do the same sort of thing, differentiate the debt ratio. It will rise if private debt grows faster than the economy. Um, I make a simplifying assumption that all uh, credit finance is investment. And this is actually confirmed by all people FAMA and French and empirical research. So you get this expression for the rate of change of debt itself. And then I get beyond that, I've got to multiply by Y over Y and rearrange. And when you do that, you get a third equation, which is now saying the rate of change of the debt ratio. And you feed that in, now I've got an equation for the debt ratio. So your final model, um, and I, also to, to, to motivate this, I have to have capitalists investing more than they borrow during more than they earn in profits during a boom and less than they earn in profits during a slump. So I have a, a linear investment function relating investment to the rate of profit as well. And what I got out of this is Minsky's financial stability hypothesis, right from macroeconomic definitions. All that nonsense that neoclassicals do wanking around about you know, consumer preferences and expectations is a waste of time. So when you simulate this model, and I will bring this one up and simulate it in Minsky, What you get is the great moderation followed by the great recession. So there's these cycles you'll see in uh, wages share versus or employment versus the wages share. Notice that they're just spiraling down. So the wages share is falling while the unemployment rates are cycling around an equilibrium level. What's happening here is as workers, as the wages fall, the income goes across to the to the bankers. So what's actually going as a distribution from workers to bankers as private debt levels rise. And then you get a period of diminishing cycles followed by rising cycles. And if I go on for long enough, there'll be a breakdown. There'll be infinite debt, zero wages, and you end up in a, in a debt deflation. So that's, that's the real world. And the properties you see there were not realized by Minsky. This is actually a, a part of the chaos theory coming out of fluid dynamics and uh, this was the complete surprise to me when I first simulated this model, but then it happened in the data. We had the great moderation followed by the great recession. So this to me was one of the reasons that I was aware that a crisis was likely long before it occurred because the dynamics of the real world mattered this chaotic, chaotic model. So that's that's the private sector, that's private debt. What about government debt? Well, this is the, this is the repeating Mancus nonsense again. Uh, negative public saving, borrow from the private sector, raise interest rates to crowd arts investment. Uh, what this has meant is with this obsession, which politicians have accepted and economists in treasuries and places like that enforce this, we've had less government spending, which has removed a stabilizing factor. And I can show that. It'd be more complicated, but I can do that. Um, it's removing a stabilizing factor from the economy. Now, what I'm going to do is look at the basic accounting. This is using the other side of Minsky was the capacity to model financial flows using governmental bookkeeping. And if you look at it, laid out the way I've got it here, you've got treasury bond sales. So there's the, the treasury sells bonds to the, to the banks and the banks pay for it using reserves. The central bank buys bonds back off them. This is the, the, the net effect of all the trading that uh, open market operations do. Uh, interest is paid to the banks. Uh, the deficit spending then occurs and banks then spend out of the revenue they're getting from the bonds. And you look, do it like that, it looks like the government is borrowing in order to spend. 
Okay, but the banks are buying bonds using reserves, which are the overall heading for all the accounts that banks have at the central bank. So where do the reserves come from? What Minsky generates as well are the differential equations. The whole idea of a Gottlieb table is to build the differential equations of financial flows. So you print those out and look at, we, we have to identify where do the positive inflows from reserves come from? And the answer is they're all government operations. Central banks are buying bonds off the banks. That adds money, adds, adds funds, not money, funds to the reserves. The treasury runs a deficit. The treasury pays interest on bonds. So all the positive entry that are stocking up reserves in the first place are creations of the government. So the government is creating the funds that banks use to buy bonds. Now, in what sense is that borrowing? None whatsoever. If I gave you a, a million dollars and said, you can't spend it, sorry, you're holding on trust for somebody else. But if you use the million to buy a million dollars in bonds off me, I'll pay you $30,000 a year. Would you say no to that deal? Okay. That's the whole idea of bond vigilante, sending down a free lunch. Of course they say yes. And there's no money involved. No money is being created by that because money is a liability of the banking sector. So the bonds are because the operations occur entirely on the asset side of the banking system ledger. It has no effect on money. So the whole idea that banks are borrowing money off private is simply wrong. It's just an asset swap. That's why they're doing it. And they get more higher return out of the out of bonds than they do out of reserves. So the full picture looks like this. And this is a very simple model in Minsky. So I'm showing money times velocity being GDP. I have the deficit being easily controlled as a percentage of GDP. Interest being paid on bonds. Uh, bonds sold to cover both the deficit and the interest on outstanding bonds. Uh, the central bank then in the net is just hypothetically is buying bonds equivalent to the interest being paid on bonds. And then banks spend very slowly. And then I'm working out the growth rate. And when you simulate the model, there's no growth when you have no deficit and a zero interest rate on bonds. When you have interest on bonds and a deficit, there's growth. If you have a surplus, you get negative growth, you go backwards. So again, as usual, the neoclass have got everything, to use a technical term, they've got everything asked about tit, totally backwards. Uh, and why, why do they sell the bonds? The only real role with the bonds, when you look at this, when you see the overall accounting, looking at all the entities in the model, is that the bond sales enable the treasury to maintain a positive balance at the central bank. And that's required by most governments as, as a rule for, um, uh, for how their central bank operate. They won't let the, central, the treasury have an overdraft at the central bank. That's the whole reason. So here's, and then what you take a look at as well, and this is the point made by modern monetary theory, but now putting it in terms of equity rather than um, uh, deficit and surplus. The negative equity of the treasury is precisely equal to, to the, the, the negative equity of the government is precisely equal to the positive equity of the non-government. So the government creates money by going into negative equity, which is a different way to the way the banks actually do it. And if people complain about that, it's like complaining about sunshine. That's what the sun does. Um, fiat currencies, that's how they work. The government creates money by going into negative equity. And that's creating positive equity for the non-government sector, precisely as much as the government goes into non-negative equity. And the gov the people say, well, how can the government manage to be negative equity? It owns the country. The country is a non-financial asset. Uh, when you look at this asset minus liabilities minus equity and the way I'm doing it in Minsky here, they are financial assets. And a financial asset is a claim on somebody else. So the sum of all claims is zero. But behind that are the, are the non-financial assets. And in the sense, you can say the government owns the country. Its non-financial assets are the country. So yes, it can handle being in negative financial equity. In fact, if it didn't do it, the only place you and I could get money from was by borrowing from private banks. And that tends to cause financial crisis, as I showed earlier. So I'm, I know the supply and demand is false, but I want to show um, what is actually going on when you learn this properly. How would you put this in a neoclassical framework? Rather than the stuff they show of loanable funds and, and, the, and increasing the demand for money, deficits add to the supply of money. So what you're going to get is the supply of money increases. Okay. That's likely to mean lower interest rates, not higher. This is the point that Warren Mosler makes as well. Less need to borrow money because the government's created money for you at no cost. This need to go to the bank to get a loan. So there's going to be a potentially not a call, not a not a direct, but a, a sort of causal link between negative debt, 
uh, between government spending and less, pri less private debt. And when you take a look at the data, this is again my Ravel software, everywhere around the world, people obsess about government debt. And in fact, everywhere around the world, private debt is greater than government debt. And when governments try to reduce their level of debt, they tend to end up causing the private sector to borrow more money. And that's happened in Turkey as well. And you guys have got a huge credit boom going on because credit is currently running at 30% of GDP. I imagine it's because GDP might be falling right now. I'm not sure. I could actually find out for you if you like. But you've got a credit bubble going on and I'd watch out for what's going to happen as well as in Turkey. Now, here's four other countries, not chosen at random. They're the good examples. Thailand, you can see the peak in private debt back then. That was the Asian financial crisis in 1997. Spain, which had credit running at 40% of GDP and then down to minus 20%. The credit rose, and you can see this huge increase in private debt here, when they were trying to accrete the Maastricht Treaty arguments. So achieving Maastricht pushed people into financial speculation, borrowing money from banks, huge bubble, and then the, the, the biggest crash as well. Australia managed to avoid this fate uh, by restarting the housing bubble but it's now you know it, it's worrying about the level of government debt and household debt or private debt is almost four times as high and then the usa which is the most important and the same story uh falling level of government debt rising private debt and then we've gone through our post-crisis levels and the covid um so we have a mistake we've made a big mistake in trying to control government debt which is not necessary when it's borrowing in your own currency and when you're not causing runaway inflation, we need to reverse the mistake. And a way to do that is a modern debt jubilee. Now, ancient debt jubilees, and I'm living in an apartment right now full of information on ancient debt jubilees. This is Michael Hudson's flat uh, just near the British Museum in London. Um, and it, Michael explains what actually happened with household debts back in and forgive them their debts. Uh, we can't do that today. We couldn't write the debts off uh, because that would bankrupt the banking sector for a start, and we can't afford to do that. And it would benefit people who'd borrowed money to gamble on asset prices over those who didn't. So a proposal I came up with is to use the government's money creation capability to replace credit-based money, of which there's too much, with fiat-based money, of which there's too little, courtesy of neoclassicals running the economy for the last 50 years. And you distribute that fiat money equally, ir irrespective of whether people are in debt or not, they get the same amount of money per capita. And then bonds are sold to the banks as an ordinary government finance. And the income from those bonds will partially compensate the banks for getting lower loan interest over time. But of course, this comes with a zero risk of default. So you can explain a lower, justify a lower rate on bonds for the banks uh, because it's compensating them for a higher, losing a higher rate, but they also have a lower level of risk. Uh, and the simple model of the MIS model looks like this. Now, I'll bring it up and uh, and just, I'll go to the bits and pieces here. So I've got Jubilee being used just to pay down household debts. So you have a Jubilee being a transfer of money to households. They're then required to use that money to reduce their debt levels. And then there are interest can be paid on bonds. I'm showing no interest being paid here. And I'll explain that in a moment. But I have a very simple model. Turnover of money in the firm sector generates GDP. A fraction of that goes to profit. The remainder goes to wages. Households then spend out of their deposit accounts. Banks spend out of their short-term equity. These are interest payments. Uh, I've got money velocity. Oh, pardon me, but I go back up again. Money velocity debt ratio. That's all just ordinary calculations. The Jubilee simply starts in a particular year, and I'm starting it in year 10. It lasts for one year. 75% of GDP is paid across in that period of time. That goes into, into household deposit accounts. They're required to reduce their debt level by just as much, and they have to be bonds issued to the same amount. So if I simulate this, GDP and growth rate are constant for a while until year 10 comes along. Then you get a, a boost to the economy. The economy actually gets stimulated by doing this. The reason being, there's no change in behavior built into the model. What's happening is people, work households, now have more of the money, banks have less, households more rapidly than banks do, the velocity of money increases, you get a boom coming out of that. So that's that's one way to go about it. I've got a, I've got a, a zero interest rate on bonds here because I just wanted to illustrate that effect without uh, any creation of money. But when the bonds are issued and paid interest, that actually creates money for the banking sector. So I simulate that again, 
and I'm now going to get after year 10, when I start getting those bonds turning up there, you're going to get sustained growth. Notice the money velocity continues to rise, the money supply continues to rise. So you're creating money for the financial sector by the interest on bonds. And the end result is dramatic level, you actually your level of total debt falls. So you see um, private, public government debt rises, private debt falls, but the sum of the two declines as well. So it's a way to delever the entire economy. Uh, I hope it's very hard you've had for neoclassicals to argue against that, but knowing them, they'll try. So, uh, and I've, this, that's a very simple version. This is rather more complicated one with share ownership and other tricks put inside there. So my idea is to use Minsky to simulate what you want to do and then do it rather than doing what you want to do and then finding, oh shit, that didn't work, which is the reality of neoclassical economic management. And finally, so advertising myself, I'm a self-employed, uh, self-crowdfunded uh, academic these days. I'd appreciate both support and, and feedback through my Patreon or Substack pages. And that's the end of my talk. I'll just uh, stop sharing the screen. I know that was pretty fast, Great. but... <laughs> no, very, okay. very good, actually. Mm. Uh... I guess uh, it's time to uh, start uh, taking questions. Um, if you raise, oh, Özgür has a question. Let's start with him then. Uh, thanks, Abir. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. I mean, uh, this was great. It did help a lot with some of the questions in my mind as well. Mm. Uh, I've got like two questions and a request, actually. Uh, the first yeah. question, is, I mean, this is something that I'm struggling they know that uh, this approach, the mainstream approach to money is wrong. I mean, it's like uh, Bank of England writes about it, the Bundesbank wrote about it, and all those kind of... Why do they stick with this in the textbooks? They, and they, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't know it's wrong. They believe it's right. No, no. I mean, I, 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 they, they don't read what they don't want to know. Okay? I, I think, <laughs> like, for example... The, the, you, you, the, 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 uh, and I've read this, the um, documents for the Nobel Prize, okay? There's an 80-page scientific right. report backing up Bernanke and those two other twits getting the Nobel Prize. It does not mention the Bank of England or the Bundesbank at all. It doesn't mention, certainly doesn't mention any of the non-Orthodox economy. They simply don't read what they don't want to know. And it's, it's a religion. I mean, how many Christians, you know, read the Koran? That's how many neoclassical economists read post Keynesian economics. But so they like, don't know. But like the central bankers know, right? Nope. No, no, nope. nope. uh, a handful of people inside will know. And of course, the financial crisis was such a shock. And like I know the people who wrote the <coughs> Bank of England paper. I met them before the crisis when we were they were building stock flow consistent models inside the Bank of England at the time. And I was just so grateful when that 2014 report came out. But I was also dealing with the neoclassicals inside there, and they they admitted they got it wrong. They were repentant, they were worried, and they were waiting to change their minds back to what they thought before the whole damn thing happened. <laughs> and I went from being, you know, given given a certain amount of acknowledgement when I walked inside the building to being cold shouldered by those same people. And they think, well, to go back to the, you know, this is the, what a this is a cult, okay? It's a cult with mathematics. Uh, they call them mathematics. Cults don't change their mind because the meteor doesn't arrive. Okay, they just change the date of the meteor. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. My question would have been like, if they know this, why are they insisting on this? Like, if, does this serve any ideological mm. or really yeah. any purpose for? Fundamentally, it's ideology. Yeah, they think it's science, but like the thing, neoclassical economics is is like a Fabergé egg made out of shattered glass. Okay, tap it anywhere, the whole thing falls apart. That was going to like, be my point. So if you take this out, yeah. and you can't protect the rest everything of like like my okay. favorite example there is actually um not ben bernanke he's pretty good it's um uh alan blinder and alan blinder did a brilliant survey of the cost structure of firms in america to support his new keynesian argument that prices were sticky the fight between the real mm -hmm. business cycle mob and the dsge mob so he wanted to say why are prices sticky now he asked questions about the cost structure expecting to confirm economics and he literally wrote in his summary the overwhelmingly bad news brackets for economic theory is that 89 percent of output involves constant or falling marginal cost 
Okay. Eighty nine, and this is the huge survey, and it beautifully put the, it, dreadful figures inside the book. But he 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 literally confronted reality, and it opposed the textbook, and he said so. And I thought I just realized a couple of about six months ago. Hey, Alan Vine has got a Mark Reedwick textbook. I wonder if he mentions his own research. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, he doesn't even mention his own fucking research. You know, this is why I say it's a cult. It's a cult. I uh, agree. The second question, the way, like, if I may. Um, I, sorry, I, I was going to say something to support uh, uh, Steve. Uh, as you know, I worked at the Indian Central Bank, Reserve Bank of India, and my director, the person I was reporting to, um, I was the head of research, she was the directing the uh, institution. I was a former uh, deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and he didn't know anything about the endogenous money. She, uh, sorry, mm. uh, and she was uh, responsible for uh, regulating the financial sector, including the banks. And she didn't even know how money was created. Yeah. So uh, well, that, that's how it is. I mean, uh, you would think that a central banker would know how. Uh, uh, the money process works in this economy, but even the central bankers don't know it. I have seen it personally. One of my coaches, Vira Lacharya, was eventually became uh, deputy governor of Reserve Bank of India, and he still talks about uh, loanable funds. Very smart fellow. I mean, unbelievable smart. The other fellow, uh, who became the governor, Raghuram Rajan, both Viral and Raghu were the uh, top students of their uh, uh, years when they graduated from high school to enter the university. So smart fellows, you would expect them uh, <laughs> to read a few things and they would see it immediately, but they don't. That's what Steve says. It's like there are Christians who don't read Quran. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'll just answer a question in the chat here from Vahab. Uh, what time aggregate unit of time you should all model in continuous time i'm using continuous time here with different frequencies for people's behavior um and the frequencies are used want to get what are called time constants in engineering uh so i highly recommend abandon thinking in discrete time it's it's there's no such thing if you read if you read uh time is continuous allowing for quantum mechanics there but it's continuous uh on our time scale and uh, if you look at Forrester, he argues strongly against discrete time unless the model itself actually behaves that way. So if you want to model the population of, of red crabs in Christmas Island, yes, it's discrete time because they, they are all born on, born on the same full moon to improve their chances of evading predators and having a minority that survive, or turtles, okay? Then discrete time makes sense, but not economics. The fact that the data is discrete is irrelevant. Uh, you need a higher frequency closer to the actual system. And you can do that with continuous time. So my models are all in continuous time. Thank you. Any other questions? I was going to ask one more question, actually. But uh, could you uh, expand a little bit more on uh, replacing credit-based money with fiat-based money when it comes to debt jubilee. You kind of like pass that part mm. uh, kind of fast. So I guess that would help. Yeah, well, the fundamentally, the idea is you have uh, the government would be uh, putting money in people's deposit accounts on condition that they then use that money to pay their debt down. So the money mm. would turn up, in the, turn up in the liabilities of the banking sector, but then the liabilities would be necessarily reduced uh, by the jubilee itself so this is like a gift from the government so the government can say we're going to give you this gift if you use it this way if you don't use it this way then you know you don't get it uh, now that would mean some people who don't have debt get a cash injection because they don't have any debt to pay down mm. that's fine also, this goes to everyone. Everyone. yeah this, yeah, this yeah. Goes to everyone. okay and the idea like a hundred thousand us dollars to every every american citizen over the age of 18 and that would reduce the household debt by about 100 percent of gdp which would be great because you'd get back to an undebted household sector and you could actually have a revival in the same way that ancient jubilees used to revive ancient civilizations. Uh, what do you suggest uh, for those who don't have any debt? To, they get you, they get exactly the same amount of money. Yeah, but what should they, don't you put any condition on them to? Uh, no, 
No, um, no. Maybe some, somewhere I... Yeah. A while ago, when we were discussing, if I'm not wrong, you were suggesting that uh, requiring those uh, who are not in debt uh, to purchase uh, equities, shares from uh, corporations would help. Uh, that was, that was. I mean, I, I've left that out now because people made an eye. I've got the, that other model I showed you has some elements of that to it, the, the more complicated model. Uh, the point uh -huh. people made was that like one one person in the in the political party I was part of when I tried that and by the best of luck with your political campaign, um, they they said well look bank firms are trying to increase the debt right now they're they're using debt to pay down their equity, cancelling shares. So if you gave it to corporation they wouldn't necessarily use it to pay their debt down. I thought that was a good argument. I haven't yet built a model where they're like you could force the firms as well to, when they got that money from people buying the shares to pay their debt down whether they wanted to or not. But I thought it was a good uh, you know, repost to my argument, um, you can still include that in the model. And then you mm -hmm. get a, a, less, a lesser stimulus coming out of the uh, extra money from the people from the government, but they would then be getting dividends from shares. So you can do it, just that I, I didn't include it in that simple model. Uh, so essentially those who don't have any debts spend it as they like in that yeah. uh, modified... At the, at the, and, uh, yeah. yeah, and, then, and then, then what you get is a a stimulus to the economy. I'm probably understating the stimulus there because I've got no change in behaviour. But if you think about your own situations, and I'm, I know this from my own personal experience, when you've got a lot of debt to pay, you, your response is, oh, I'm going to, I've am going to, i got to save. Now, when you save, you don't save, okay? You might, you slow down how fast you spend. Saving does not have any impact on the amount of money in existence. So when people try to save, they spend more slowly. So the velocity of money would decline because of high levels of private debt. Now, if you reduce the level of private debt, you may well stimulate more spending. So you actually get more of a boost than I was showing in that model. Mm -hmm. uh, Dollar uh, has a question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question is, um, so in the end, would you suggest, I'm, I'm also trying to confirm if I understood your theory, theories correctly. Uh, would you suggest, uh, for, for example, for the case of Turkey, uh, a credit uh, slowdown in credit conditions, uh, fiscal contraction, but at the same time, uh, sorry, fiscal expansion and credit contraction. That kind of mix. Are you are you trying to say that that's a good mix for overall policy, or perhaps uh... that's that that that's a possibility. Um, I mean, this is this. What I'm showing you is just toy models here, of course, toy. You know, toy systems with toy data in them. I, I roughly put the data in there based on American data, but you know, there's some things you can't find out. I can't find, for example, what household deposits are versus corporate deposits. So I didn't include that. But yes, you would definitely, I'd, I'd want to very seriously test this out before I um, um, uh, decided to, to give any policy a go. And, you know, the whole idea, this is, I'm just showing, you mentioned you're from India? No, from Turkey, no. Oh, uh, pardon me. Sorry. Okay. 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 That's India's data. I'll just go back to Turkey again, as you can see it on the screen there. Uh, let's see. Ah. Hang on. Uh, that's Thailand, and we have Turkey. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely like. This is a radical policy compared to what's been done for the last, you know, fifty years. It's it, it's a changing direction, which is necessary, but it's still very radical policy proposal. So I'd want to test this out and simulate as many possible arrangements as I could in a much more sophisticated model than I put there before I tried it. But in my my you know my feeling is from this simple model that it would work, it would simulate the economy, it would reduce the dominance of the financial sector. And that's one thing we have to get and the financial sector has crippled capitalism in the last 40 years. And we're going to pay very badly for that, I think, with climate change coming our way. We've got plenty of financial engineers, not enough real ones. So I want to reduce the power of the financial sector. But of course, you know, I think my odds, my odds of even getting this policy done are slightly better than the odds of being elected in Australia, and they were dreadful. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> any other questions? We have two uh, questions from YouTube. Okay. Yeah, the question from the Johan. Uh, Johan asked that the first question is the how much 
chance uh, do we have of implementing the modern debt jubilee? The second one, the, is it possible to reform the system so that we no longer have money as debt? Second part, no. Um, you, you, have you could easily imagine that the asset would be uh, a, uh, a share. Okay, so you could change the nature of the asset backing away from being debt towards being like an equity share uh, in, in the economy in some sense. Or, uh, uh, but fundamentally, certainly private, private. Uh, well, for example, the um, again speaking of the Muslim system, the you can regard Islamic finance as being uh, equity based debt rather than equity based money rather than debt based money. So that is a feasible switch, but you still need an asset to back your liability, and. In terms of a chance of infinity, not a hope in hell. Uh, I'm afraid I've just got used to the fact that neoclassicals are going to dominate no matter what. Any sensible policies won't uh, won't be brought through. We'll do all this stuff in the aftermath. And if you look at how we got debt levels down in the 1930s, it was simple. Germany invaded the rest of Europe. We destroyed Germany. And bang, debt levels fell because of the huge level of government spending. So we have a third world war. We'll eliminate the debt problem. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is from uh, Gal, if I'm not wrong. Why don't you ask your question, Gal? Uh, hi, thank yeah. you for the talk. I most of the time I watched the YouTube and was a brilliant as usual. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier that we should always use continuous time models because that's how the economy works. Do you have a good reference of, like, the logic is clear to me, but the technique is unclear to me? What I'm familiar with is discrete time models, SFCs. Yeah, okay. please get away from them. I mean, that's, uh, it, it, discrete time is better than no time, okay? So you, that's, that's an improvement of what the neoclassicals do, but it's still the wrong way to model a dynamic system. So I've got a, on my profstevekane.com uh, page, I didn't mention that on the link but that's my sort of my one of my working websites if you go to profstein.com slash minsky you'll find the, the modeling with minsky manual there and i explain in quite a bit of detail why it's the wrong way to go about it and what the alternative is and minsky basically doesn't let you use discrete time that's a deliberate choice i've been asked to include it there i refuse it's a bit like like it's like short it's like to me somebody asked me to put discrete time in minsky is like my child saying daddy can i put my hand on the radiator the answer is no, son, you can't. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll go read it. Good. Uh, any other questions? Hello. I'll wave, I'll wave a hello to Linwood down. I haven't seen you for a long time, mate. I'm glad to have you on the audience here, even if you're being quiet. Yes, Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was hi, able hi. to. I came in came in late, so I didn't hear the hear the beginning. Otherwise, I may have some questions, but but you and I on in the same accord usually. So yeah, no absolutely. Problem. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll pop you. I'll pop a copy of the presentation, of course, to Sabri to share around. So you'll see the whole thing there, and I've recorded it, so it'll go up on YouTube. Uh, thank you. So appreciate it. Great, so great work, Steve. Great work. Thank you. Furthermore, uh, the presentation is on YouTube at the moment. Uh, uh, Octai started broadcasting it, so. Uh, if you yeah. go to the uh, Economics webpage, uh, YouTube, uh, you should be able to uh, listen to the entire presentation from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, um, well, I'll listen to it again also, of course. <laughs> I'm writing a paper <laughs> about, uh, uh, about uh, a related topic these days, so um, I'll use some ideas from uh, what you presented today. Uh, right. Any other questions? Now, I might ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. The MMT guys uh, usually focus on uh, the government injected by, via public deficits as the ultimate source of money, right? Uh, but well, one, yeah, it, 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 it's the fundamental source of money, not necessarily the ultimate, but the exactly, fundamental source. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And they don't put so much stress on endogenous money. Why is that? No, they leave it out, yeah. Uh, what do you think is that? Uh, because if, if you bring endogenous money in, neoclassical economics collapses. Okay? There's, this, is, this is the whole problem of neoclassical economics. Uh, if you admit any element of the real world that contradicts the theory, 
the theory falls apart. The only way to maintain it is not to, is not to acknowledge elements of the real world that contradict the theory. So they don't acknowledge endogenous money. They don't endogenous. They don't acknowledge falling marginal cost, which is the re reality for most corporations on the planet. Um, they don't acknowledge that you can't create demand curves the way that they think you create demand curves. They ignore the instability of uh, a multi-sectoral price system, the Ron Frobenius theorem. The amount of stuff they ignore could fill more books than they've written. I was. Yeah, I meant the MMT. Uh approach the modern, oh, the modern yeah yeah, yeah okay. the, mod, the um, modern money theory i think i mean i think that's coming around oh the modern monetary theory really focused on government spending exactly. and government debt yeah didn't look at credit yeah um I, I i came in the opposite direction i looked at credit first and had governments i mean i included government spending in my first paper in 1995 so I've, I've been aware of the countervailing effect of government spending that way, but they focus on the actual dyna uh, you know, dynamics and structure of government money creation. And in some ways, you've got to do that. You've got to focus on something. So their focus wasn't on credit. And now mine, mine was, wasn't on government. Now I'm looking at both. And I would like modern monetary theory to do the same thing. And that's one reason I built Minsky, because Minsky is designed for you know, a gener generic system dynamic modeling. And Tyrone Keynes is here as the the expert on using Minsky for anything. Uh, but what it really lets you do that no other software package does is model money properly. And that, of course, includes government money creation as well as as well as private money creation. So Minsky is a tool that can enable modern monetary theory to expand its remit to include the role of private debt. And I'd be delighted if they started doing it. Yeah. One more question. Um, what struck me in your model is that uh, you made the assumption that um, you know, all um, you, there was an assumption about investments, right? Oh, the debt is used for finance investment. Yeah. Exactly, and even though investment, well, uh, even though investments go to the real economy, if that's the assumption, uh, still you have cycles, right? Did I get it wrong? Yeah, it, there's no way from evading cycles. The only way to evade cycles is to die. So even if even if these investments went to real, uh, you know, uh, GDP creating economic activities, yep. even then. Yep. Okay. So Richard uh, Werner is not um, fully correct because he is um, he's suggesting that if credit creation, if endogenous money goes to GDP uh, creating instead of financial transactions, if, if uh, those sources go to GDP creating uh, activities, then we wouldn't have cycles. And the example he gives is the German economy for 200 years. You mean Richard Werner? Richard Werner, yeah. Yeah, no, Richard's wrong on that. Okay, okay. okay. That struck I mean, me he, in your model he, and that's- uh, Yeah, R R R Richard, Richard's point, I mean, I, I concede a lot of, I mean, I, I like Richard's work and I concede a lot of his points. But to say that it doesn't have cycles, I mean, everything is cyclical. Your your body is cyclical. If you cut your cycles down, that's one nice way to die. Um, you know, so ev every living system has cycles. And the whole idea that equilibrium is what comes out of a system is just showing ignorance of dynamic systems. Most economists are ignorant of dynamic systems. I'm not amazed people who are otherwise sensible make a comment like that. But if you don't know dynamic systems and complex, what we've got is systems subject to an external forcing function, which in our case is energy, ultimately. But money is part of it, another form of a forcing system. And that will cause cycles. Uh, the whole it, We have this obsession in the economics with equilibrium. And it's really, it shows how little mathematics economists actually know to believe that a dynamic system can be in equilibrium. Uh, you know, and they, it also to believe equilibrium is a desirable state. I mean, uh, I've had some friends give some rather rude examples of what equilibrium would mean, for example, in sexual relationships. <laughs> You've got uh, to move. Okay. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, through some mathematics, uh, given that what I uh, was doing way back then, uh, you can introduce some dissipation into the system, which would uh, at least. Uh, uh, dampen dampen the uh, uh, cycles, right? No, it could actually because... amplify them. It dep depends upon your parameters and your behavior. But uh, 
I mean, like if I feed a time delay into the system, then you get amplified cycles. Um, you can anticipate right, yeah, the direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Amplification is also a possibility, of course. It depends on the size of the, the, the dissipation factor. But if, if somehow you choose the sign appropriately, then maybe the amplitude of the oscillations um, yeah. can be controlled. And, that, and, that, and if you go back and take a look at Phillips's work in the 1950s, that's what he was trying to add to economic theory, bring in engineering concepts of time constants, time delays, uh, lags, feedback systems, and so on. And then, then you've got a complex system, and of course, you can try to bring in policy which can attenuate cycles. Uh, mm. That's all feasible. Uh, but that's you've got to be living in a real world where equilibrium is not stable. And then that's you know, then we might start getting somewhere. I think it's also because the economics is an open system. I mean, it's getting net energy from uh, its environment, right? So yep. it's not a closed yeah. system, and um, it's subject to thermodynamics in a sense. Right? Yep. And I think you were um, working on that. I saw one of your models uh, trying to introduce thermodynamics to economics. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Georges Rogan was the first person to really try to learn on a grand scale. And I think he overdid it. He tried to use the mathematics of thermodynamics as the mathematics of economics. The, the fundamental thing you need to take in is that, yes, we are an open system. We're taking energy from the outside. That's both solar energy into the planet yeah. and, the, and the economy being based on exploiting uh, preserved solar energy, which is where the fossil fuel uh, spurt, spurt of growth came for the Industrial Revolution. So you necessarily have an open system uh, with energy being pumped into it. Uh, and then that's what powers everything. Uh, so what I've done is simply say, like when you, when you, this is the work I've done with Matthias Criselli and Tim Garrett, but when you take a look at the, uh, the, the two production theory models that dominate neoclassical economics and post-Keynesians, neoclassicals use the Cobb-Douglas production function. And you cannot reform that to be aware of energy. If you do, you destroy the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. And of course, they don't want to know about that. So they stick with not including energy in their models. But when you when you look at the, the Leontief equations, that is fundamentally empirically derived. So Leontief just said there's some, for some reason, God knows why, there's some constant relationship in most countries between the measured value of, of GDP and the measured value of capital stock. So use the capital output ratio empirically derived. When you follow the logic through that I've done about the role of energy in production, what it turns out is that ratio is the efficiency with which machineries turns energy exactly, yeah. into useful work. And that's 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 the link. And then, of course, with that, you can also have waste generation, you can have energy depletion, all those sorts of things, which are realistic elements of being the economy being better than the ecology. And that's what we need to have. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mehmet, for, yeah. for your nice questions. Um, By the way, I haven't seen you for years. How are you, Mehmet? Oh, <laughs> Sabri. <laughs> well, <laughs> long time no see, right? Like uh, six, seven years or so. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. We have to yeah, catch maybe. up. We have yeah. to catch up. <laughs> Let's get together. Uh, when yeah, I have yeah. That. Sure. Yeah, sure. Mm. Oh, Michael, uh, yeah, there's Michael Kiermoff's work. And Michael's, <laughs> he won't see yeah. me because I, I take COVID seriously and he doesn't. So he refuses to meet up with me, though, which I'm annoyed by. But, uh, but yeah, Michael knows his stuff on money. He actually worked as a banker before he became a, a mainstream economist. So he, he can include endogenous money in a dig SG model and he gets completely different results. And now he's experiencing the same shit that I've been through where they, you talk at them and they just, you know, in one ear and out the other. In fact, it probably bounces off the eardrums, doesn't even get inside the cranium. cranium. So they just ignore anything they don't want to understand. Uh, but you know, you can do it. It's incredibly complicated. I had a, remember having a meeting with Michael where we were talking about, and I've forgotten what's adding some extra element to the model. And he said, it might take me a couple of years to do it because working out the DSU model is an incredibly laborious process. Uh, you know, the, some sectors have margin, price equal marginal cost, others have price greater than marginal cost and all the sort of mathematics and the incredibly amount of 
you know, logical maneuvering. I said, I, I, I can do that in 20 minutes. And that's the trouble. <laughs> the LDSG framework is so rigid that it's incredibly hard to elaborate and make it more sophisticated. Um, so even if they do it, and of course, when you when you do it, you get results they don't like. So they they go to Michael's presentation, they nod, they smile, they shake their hand, they clap, they walk out and they forget. But by the way, they call it dynamic, but there is no time in it, actually, right? It's all it, it's, it's, it, it, it's neither dynamic nor general. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> it's stochastic uh, equilibrium uh, modeling. Uh, yeah. Uh, all time, what was this? Uh, John Rob Robinson, I guess. Uh, I yeah. heard that story from Jayati a while ago. Uh, a student uh, asked uh, John Robinson, where is the time in these models? And she said, looking at the blackboard, it's coming towards you from the <laughs> blackboard, right? It's, <laughs> That's it's <right>. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They take a snatch up. Yeah. It's static, actually. Yeah, exactly. Time, the they, they go from one, and the whole idea of the Ramsey growth model, you know, you know what the future mm. equilibrium is. It's unstable. You therefore jump onto the eigenvector that's the stable eigenvector. You're like, you know, mm. it's like somebody saying, I can throw a ball bearing at a horse and get it to stick on the saddle. Yeah, yeah well, good luck. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, Okta, you were going to say something, I guess, right? Um, a question from YouTube or something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they would. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, they may hoard it, but you know, uh, you're looking at aggregate levels here, and. At the aggregate level, to say the aggregate nobody would spend money they were given, just doesn't make sense. Individuals might hoard; there'll be misers amongst the ones you give the money to. But the aggregate, you know, talking, you know, like in America's case, you're talking 350 million people. Uh, you know, say, let's say 250 million over the age of 18. I think a few of them are going to spend the money. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. If uh, there are no other questions, I guess it's time to say thank you, Steve, okay. uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, oh, uh, Argun has uh, something to say, I guess. He's, uh, okay. No, he's... Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric, Steve. Eric, Eric's got his hand up. Is that Eric? Do you want to make? Okay, that was also an actor. I'm just congratulating you and uh, sending my claps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Okay. Thank okay. you, Steve. I'll catch you, you later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, all colleagues.